Okay, we are live. All right. Lovely. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in. I am here with Dr. Odette Suter, and we're going to be chatting about senior dog health today. Uh, for those of you that are joining in, I know it's earlier than our usual lives, but don't worry, we are going to repost so you can catch this a little bit later. Um, we're talking about senior dogs. Yesterday, I chatted with Dr. Katie Woodley about canine cancer prevention, and um, it got me thinking about so, so many things. But I think the thing with senior dogs is that's something that all of us experience inevitably. You know, it's not like, oh, my dog had this issue or that issue. They all get old eventually. So this is a topic that I've been really, really excited to learn more about as my dog approaches his senior years. Um, if you guys are just joining in, don't worry. We are going to have a Q&A about 30 minutes in uh, with Dr. Suter to answer some of your questions about senior dog health. Feel free to drop them in the comments right now. Uh, and in case you have to pop out, no worries. We're going to repost this live and we will do our best to get to all of your questions in the order that they're posted. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Suter. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hello. Thank you for having me, Ruby. It's just a pleasure and an honor. And um, I, I got such a sweet gift. Well, not so sweet, but a gift. It, the, the thought was sweet uh, in the mail just a, a few weeks ago with some of the treats that you guys sell. And my patients are really loving them. So thank you so much for that. You know, Thank surprise. You. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of uh, people get surprised when they open the box and there's rabbit feet or something like that in there because it's so unexpected. But I'm glad your patients are enjoying them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. These have been some interesting treats and some of them have interesting responses, especially the green lip muscle. We just talked mm -hmm. about it a little bit and I find it very entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, green and muscle is one of the things on my list to ask you about, because that is something that we're uh, often talking about when we, we refer to joint health, especially for senior dogs. But don't worry, guys, we are going to get into all of that here in a bit. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we have a few people already in here. Yeah, so hello, Michelle and uh, I don't know if I'm spelled saying that name right. <laughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, well, while you guys are trickling in, just to introduce myself really quickly, my name is Ruby. I am one of two founders of Real Dog Box. We make and deliver a monthly box of air dried treats and chews, and we also offer nutrition consultations to help you feed real food. And all of the vets that I have been talking to on my series as of late um, have been proponents of a fresher food diet. And so um, it's been very, very helpful to have them come on and uh, give us tips about what we can do to make our dog's diet just a little bit better. Um, so Dr. Odette, you are a holistic veterinarian, uh, international best-selling author of What Your Vet Never Told You. I just ordered the book on Amazon. I'm very, very excited to receive that. Um, you guys may have seen her on her recent talks with the Pet Summit on Doggy Detox. Uh, and I think uh, it was there was another holistic talk that you did recently. Can you sort of tell our audience how you got into holistic healing, like just your journey as a veterinarian? Well, if we start in the beginning, I was born. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I, I've been thinking about my journey quite a bit, you know, not recently. And it's really interesting because I wasn't really into animals. And, you know, as a kid, I'm like, yeah, we don't really need a dog. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when my mom brought one home, I'm like, really, was that necessary? And it was always my sister who brought animals. And she was then the one that dragged me to a barn to go horseback riding and, um, you know, after some kicking and screaming, uh, I I ended up falling in love with horses and and that was kind of the rest of it. And I ended up then becoming a vet. But I guess another interesting aspect that I've been pondering a little bit more recently is that, you know, I grew up in Switzerland. I went to vet school in Switzerland. And then when I came to the United States, 
basically I was not allowed to practice veterinary medicine because I didn't have an American, you know, a US license. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then I was very resistant and stubborn. <laughs> not that I have completely lost that, but uh, I just didn't really see the need for me to get another license because I was already a vet. So it's like, what do these Americans think, you know, that they're any better than we are. And um, so anyways, after a few years of, of trying all kinds of other things and always coming back to the animals, you know, I ended up on some YouTube, uh, not YouTube, uh, Yahoo groups and, and such, helping other people, you know, supporting them in their, in their journey and, and such. I just realized that even though I tried other things, it's like I kept coming back to the animals. And so I ended up going, you know, studying it all over again. So basically kind of going to vet school a second Did time. Did you have to do the whole program over? No, no, I didn't have to do the whole program over, but it felt that way because I had, <laughs> you know, forgotten a lot of things. And so I had to study a lot of, you know, of everything again in order to pass all the exams so in a way it did feel like i was going through vet school a second time it took me a couple of years to you know get through all of it you know yeah. to, to pass and, and such and certainly <laughs> i was not yeah anyways <laughs> well i i'm curious about the curriculum in switzerland you know a lot of there's a lot of criticism about the vet schools specifically here in the US and the lack of focus on nutrition and preventative medicine. Was there a difference in, in what you learned? No. And the thing is too, that the the, the way vet school is in, in Europe or in Switzerland, where I was compared to what it is now um, is different. I mean, we had very little practical training. Um, we had only like maybe three, four, five months or so of practical uh, training where we were more observing than anything else, really. Um, whereas here they have an entire year of, you know, being in practice at the university, basically at the vet school. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we didn't have a lot of nutrition. I mean, certainly we learned about all the vitamins and minerals and, and all of that, but there was no real practical application of that. Although I think if I remember correctly, we learned a little bit more about farm animals, mm. nutrition, you know, and because, well, in Switzerland, they still have quite a bit of farms and um, sure. more livestock to care of. Yeah. Uh, so I think we did learn some of that. But to be honest with you, I can't quite remember it all. <laughs> it was so long ago. It was a long time ago. But Certainly, we ne didn't learn about raw food or fresh food diets or any of that um, sort of thing. But when I grew up and, you know, my mom got this dog that I didn't want, um, she was basically feeding her a raw diet. So she would feed her raw meat. and But she would add some, some sort of grain flakes mm -hmm. to it. So it wasn't like the low carb raw, but still my dog you know, at home and she grew up on a raw diet in that sense. And there wasn't a lot of talk about it. Um, but, you know, that was like some almost 30 years ago now. Sure, so sure. Changed so what led you to writing your book? It's titled What Your Vet Never Told You. Well, I kept feeling like I was just repeating myself over and over again when I was talking to my clients and when you do the initial consultation, you want to make sure that you kind of get on the same page, you know, if, especially if you're trying to restore health and and change things around. And so there's a certain amount of education that is necessary. But in the short time that I have in, in these initial consultations, even though they're, you know, at least an hour and a half long, I can't really put all of that in there because for one it's overwhelming um, to people uh, and so and they're more focused on their animals so their listening ability is a little bit decreased and mm -hmm. you know the stress of the new and animals maybe you know a little bit worried and anxious you know so there's so much going on that it's a little hard to get all that information in there mm -hmm. plus do the exam come up with a plan and so on so that's the reason I, I wrote the book because I wanted for people to know what it is that we were really doing. 
yeah. you know, so that they knew that we weren't just trying to put band-aids on something yeah. in a holistic way because unfortunately there are, there is that sort of approach as well where um, you know herbs are used or something else is used because it's natural but the approach that's used is still kind of with the old conventional thinking of let's get rid of the symptoms mm -hmm. and so i wanted for people to understand that what we're doing was to look to find the cause and help to restore all of the cells of the body and not just trying to cover up or get rid of symptoms so we wanted to actually take the symptoms and figure out why are they there and what are they indicating sure uh, so that's that's yeah. why i just wanted to for people to understand where i was coming from and well yes. it looks like uh michelle has your book and says it's fabulous so i'm very excited myself to read it mm -hmm. uh, for everyone that's just joining in, we are talking about senior dog health. So we're going to dive into that subject. And if you have a senior dog or one that is approaching their senior years, don't hesitate to post any questions in the comments. Uh, we will try our best to do a Q&A and answer all of those in order uh, the second half of this live. Um, but yes, we invited you today to talk about senior dogs. Yesterday, we had a live with Dr. Katie Woodley about canine cancer and prevention. And she had some pretty alarming statistics that she shared. I think it was over 60 or 70% of dogs over the age of two are being diagnosed with cancer. That's just nuts to me. What, what kind of uh, health issues are you seeing in your practice specifically to senior dogs? Um, well, one of the most common things I would say is mobility issues as they get older. Mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly a, a big deal when, when they get older. And then, you know, the lumps and bumps here and there, um, dental issues. Uh, but yeah, mobility issues are, are definitely a big, big thing. And is something that I'm very, I pay a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific breeds that you notice patterns in that um, these issues are more common in? Well, I mean, it can be it can be affecting every you know any dog, but certainly I tend to see more of the bigger dogs that come in for for these types of issues. <coughs> Excuse me, because it's a little bit more not necessarily more obvious but it's more of a problem as far as dealing with it um, for example if you have a german shepherd who is losing hind end um, strength is getting weaker and weaker and then eventually they have to be carried around and oftentimes they will also become incontinent so they will leak urine you know things like that um, obviously that's a that's a big that's a big deal yeah is the incontinence typically um connected to any older dog or are there other underlying health issues well i mean incontinence can be from different uh you know can have different causes i mean it could be a urinary tract infection that will cause some incontinence it could also be that the bladder and the sphincters that close the bladder so that it doesn't leak um, that they don't get enough innervation for example or that the animal just simply can't feel their bladder anymore because the nerves to the bladder are decreased. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the information into the bladder is decreased because they have a stenosis of the spinal cord where there's a narrowing of, or of the spine, I should say, where there's a narrowing of the spinal canal where the spinal cord goes through. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that narrows down, it will start to put pressure on the spinal cord and then the nerves the nerve input into the different areas of the body is just not the same. Right, so they don't even know, they don't have to feel that sense of urgency to go. Yeah, and then there's also dementia, you know, sometimes they just get to the point where their brain is not functioning quite as well as it should be. So when the signal is coming from the bladder and saying, hello, I need to be happy, <laughs> the brain goes, huh? <laughs> You know, yeah. they, they may not realize it or may realize it too late. I have one patient, little Jack Russell. Um, he he realizes that he has to go, but it's at a, at a very late point in that 
you know, in that timing. <laughs> so he just has to go. And, yeah. and so it just comes out. Yeah. Um, he's so he's very well aware that he's peeing, but he doesn't ha he's not getting the signal early enough, I guess. Right. To get like, up, ask to. to go outside. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I got to pee. And then it comes out. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think um, if we've ever lived with someone older in our own households, humans, these are mm -hmm. things that we tend to see uh, mm -hmm. similarly, which makes me sad because our dog's lifespans are so much shorter. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of things can we generally do to prepare ourselves or our dogs before they enter their senior years? Well, but that's a really good question. And the answer to that is prevention. Because if you're, if you're doing a lot before they get into their senior years, their senior years are going to be a lot better. Because once you see a lot of these senior issues that show up, like hind end weakness, uh, dementia, these types of things, you're, you're already way too late. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, the problem started earlier. And so if you help to maintain their mobility early on with regular body work, um, training, exercise, you know, that sort of thing, and also mental stimulation to keep the brain active and decreasing inflammation or, or having them on an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle, then they will have a lot less problems. Uh, as they get older and they will have more of like a healthy, healthy, healthy kind of dead sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. trajectory rather than healthy, healthy, and then slowly de declining yeah. in their senior years, because that's what we want. I mean, we want them to have a really good life, good quality of life, and then basically, you know, fall asleep. Their sleep. Yeah. yeah, that sort of thing. I mean, I, I guess that's what everybody would like, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the best thing you can do for a senior dog is to work on things before their seniors and invest a little bit on, into their maintenance and, and yeah. So I want to touch on two things. One thing that uh, you mentioned is body work. And then the other thing I think is important to our audience specifically is nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I already see the questions coming in, a few of them are the same as mine. So we'll probably start doing Q&A a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. um, but touching on body work, what do you mean by that? Well, with with body work, you, you're basically keeping the body aligned so that it can move correctly and properly and efficiently as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess on an extended level, body work would also include, a, include keeping their toenails short. Um, it would include, at least in my practice, I do a lot, lot of chiropractic work. So doing that regularly, because that will also keep everything aligned better and will keep joints uh, moving better. Because the thing is, when, when they're misaligned and there's inflammation on top of that from poor diet, for example, then they will start to create, you know, have arthritis because all of the muscles you know, are innervated by the, by the nervous system. And the muscles are what keep stabil, uh, the joints stable. And when you have a stable joint that moves in the directions that it is supposed to move, then that joint can stay healthy. So there will not be the, de you know, the decrease of cartilage um, size and, and thickness, and it, it won't get worn down. Mm -hmm. It won't be inflamed. They won't have buildup of bone around it to help stabilize it. So if you can maintain these muscles working properly the way they should, then the joints will be more stable and the joints will just be more healthy, um, you know, into the old, into old age. And it's not just the joints of the leg. It's also the joints of the spine uh, of the vertebrae, you know, the little joints that are between the, the two vertebrae. Um, and that's really important because if there is some arthritis that starts to build up, it starts to encroach on the spinal canal, mm -hmm. which puts compression on the spinal cord. And, and then you kind of left with not as much yeah. you know, information into the nerves because the nerves are like a water hose or the spinal cord is like a water hose. You step on it. There's no water flowing. Mm -hmm. you take your foot off that water hose. Then you have flow again. So if you have, you know, 
thickening of the little spinal joints that then put more bone growth into the spinal canal, then it puts pressure on that spinal cord and then it just doesn't work as well. Yeah, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. I imagine uh, it's similar to when I see my chiropractor, which unfortunately is only when I have a problem after it hurts. And he always tells me that I need to make appointments before it hurts. Uh, yeah. So I never get there. Uh, what kind of frequency do you suggest for, for dogs to get body work or chiropractic care? Well, ideally probably once a month would probably be good just to maintain, but some dogs maintain pretty well, so they may not need it quite as much. But certainly if your dog falls off of something, can't jump in the car anymore all of a sudden, or on the sofa, or they, it has a run-in with another dog, you know, where they just kind of body slam or, you know, things like that, or you see a little bit of change in the, in the line of the, you know, of, her, of their back. So if they all of a sudden have a bit of a hunched up back, for example, that certainly is a good time to have a look at it. And I use Cairo for just about anything. It's always my first go-to for anything, GI issues, um, liver problems, kidney diminish, you know, kidney function, et cetera, because everything is innervated by the nervous system. And so if I can make that nervous system function more efficiently, then all of these internal organs can also work more efficiently. So that's always my first go-to because that can eliminate a lot of things. You know, like a lot of people say, oh yeah, my dog is getting old and oh, and then they grab a bunch of supplements, you know, like what kind of joint supplements should I use, et cetera. And I'm like, well, let's just do a little Cairo and see what happens. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, the animal gets better from that and and then you don't need all of these supplements, whereas with the supplements, you don't really fix the problem. You're just kind of putting a Band-Aid on it, and it may or may not do anything. So yeah. I'm a big proponent of body work. Okay. Well, now I wish you lived closer. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Let's, let's jump into nutrition, because I think that's where uh, a lot of people start to worry. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can bring this question up. Before we talk about their efficiency, is there like an, an optimum diet that you recommend even before our dogs enter their senior years? Well, I'm a big proponent of feeding any individual, human or animal, a diet that they would eat in the wild because that's what the body is made to process. So the closer you can feed them to what they would eat in the wild, the healthier they can be. And when it comes to dogs and, and cats as well, a raw diet, that's pretty much the closest that we can get unless you send them out into the woods and <laughs> tell them, go find your dinner. <laughs> um, but so, so that would be that. But, you know, it, it depends a little bit on the animal because a lot of animals have GI issues, especially as they get older, they may not have the same capability of digesting and breaking down their food because they're like making less enzyme uh, enzymes and less uh, bile acids. Uh, so they may not be as efficient at breaking down things. So they mean it may need a little bit of extra help with enzymes and a little bit of um, bile supplements or a little bit of stomach uh, or, you know, like a little bit of acidifying substances, mm -hmm. like hydrochloric acid. Which is why it's typically harder to switch your dog to a raw diet in their senior years. Um, we we switched our 12-year-old Doberman cold turkey and mm -hmm. expected some digestive upset, you know, by way of, I'm going to have to use the restroom and not give you a whole lot of warning. But he adjusted pretty quickly. Within about a week, his stools were nice and firm and small. Mm -hmm. um, do you find yourself recommending that people make that switch after their dog has uh, encountered some of these health issues that we weren't able to prevent? Yeah, I mean, that's always one of the first um, steps that I take is making sure that the diet is more appropriate to what they really need because the cells have a need for nutrients. And if you don't provide them these nutrients, these cells cannot function properly and cells that don't function properly then end up 
as symptoms, you know. Uh, so definitely diet is, is the fir- one of the first things that I address with people. But of course, with a senior dog, I will always go much more slowly with anything that might that I might want to change. And I may not change as much at the same time, just because I want to make sure that I keep them on an upward trajectory. I don't want to make them feel a lot worse because especially if they're very senior and have a lot of issues, they are already walking a very fine line where, you know, any little something could just throw them off. So I definitely go very um, slowly with with these types of changes in in senior dogs, just because I want to make sure I'm not making them feel worse. Because right. then it's harder to bring them back up because they don't have that same energy as a young dog to just recover. You know, right? So they get older, they lose some of the energy. The cells are not as efficient at making energy, and if they don't have enough energy, it's harder for the body to, you know, adjust yeah. and adapt. And, I, and there's an emotional component, I think, too, is what you're saying, which is our dogs know that they're not supposed to potty in the house. And when they have an accident, I think that there's this disappointment almost of like mm-hmm. of that accident happening, um, which sort of leads me to this question, which I'm very interested in knowing, are senior dogs less efficient at utilizing nutrients or perhaps uh, digesting the food? Uh, yes, I, I would think so. Um, it, it again, it depends a little bit on on the animal and and where they are in their seniorness, I guess, because um, there are certainly some that are probably utilizing nutrients quite efficiently still. Uh, for example, a friend of mine just shared some photos on on Facebook of her 15 year old kind of mid sized dog up in the mountains hiking for quite a bit, you know. So that dog is probably pretty good at utilizing nutrients because he's getting a lot of exercise. So as a result, his muscles and his blood circulation and everything is is working really well. So he's probably utilizing the nutrients that he's getting pretty, pretty well. But if you have a dog, for example, who's just laying around, not doing a whole lot, not moving much, poor muscle mass they probably are going to be a bit less efficient just because everything is a bit slowed down. Yeah. And so the metabolic rate is slowed down. Um, And they may also be less efficient at digesting things. So not just utilizing the nutrients once they're in the system, but also just processing them in their digestive tract. And especially nowadays, we see so many dogs with digestive issues. And that's not just for senior dogs. That's also for younger dogs who have microbiome imbalances. So they have microbes in the gut that are imbalanced, you know, some too much and some too little, um, you know, presence. Um, And then, you know, how, how it depends also on how many enzymes they still make, how much of, you know, how well the pancreas works, how much bile uh, acids are made in the in the bla- uh, in the gall uh, in the liver and then dumped through the gallbladder into the GI tract and also how much stomach acid are they making are right. they making enough are they making too much um, so I think that as far as utilizing nutrients that's really not not necessarily just a senior thing it's just because so many animals have GI issues why do you um, think that is yeah well, GI issues um, glyphosate is probably one of the biggest culprits and then all the antibiotics that are being used the preventatives constantly uh, because for example heartworm preventatives are anti-parasitic drugs that also can affect the microbiome so you know there's that and then poor diet but definitely whatever chemicals we're spraying around and glyphosate is in everything these days 90 70 to 90 percent of all water and air samples have glyphosate in it and a lot of the diets are loaded with glyphosate, which is Roundup. Uh, well, it's the active ingredient of Roundup for those who don't know. Uh, so that's that's definitely a big issue because it's a antibacterial. It also creates leaky gut, uh, which that decreases efficiency of the gastrointestinal tract and causes uh, problems for sure. That's why you see all of these gluten-free things. Sure. 
in the store. It's not necessarily that people are sensitive to wheat. It's just that all the wheat is sprayed with Roundup right before it's being harvested. And that causes upset in the gastrointestinal tract. And so that's probably more of what people are actually sensitive to. Yeah. So and people, they go to Europe and they eat pizza in Europe and they're fine. <laughs> and then they come home and eat pizza here and they have major digestive issues. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah that, and that reminds me, you spoke about doggy detox, which is something that unfortunately we all sort of have to detox ourselves from the toxins in the environment that are almost unavoidable here, specifically in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, everywhere. I mean, it rains everywhere. And then, you know, you have the winds that kind of spread things around. So mm -hmm. there's no place on this planet anymore that's 100% clean. Yeah. It just doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, we humans have made quite a mess. <laughs> uh, so how does a senior dog diet need to be adjusted in terms of protein and fat to a younger dog? Well, I mean, you still want to have a good quality protein in there and fat as well, because that's really what helps to build the body. So protein is important for, you know, amino acids and, and amino acids are what are the, you know, are the building blocks for muscles, tendons, ligaments, nerves. I mean, pretty much everything in the body, 80% of the body's dry weight is protein. So protein is definitely necessary and fat as well and especially fat is used for um, energy in dogs and, and cats as well and humans as well uh, for example i do a lot better on fatty diet rather than carb diet even though i kind of like carbs too <laughs> <laughs> but in any case it, it provides a little bit of cleaner fuel so fats different types of fats can be very beneficial as they get older especially for the brain so omega-3s mm -hmm. for example or uh, mct uh, oils such as from coconut oil for example um, that's really good fuel for the brain so it can actually make the brain function better because an inflamed brain will have a little bit of more difficulty making energy or uh, well, function and so that can help it sounds like everything that you're mentioning you know i'm a fresh food proponent so these are things that i'm already including in my dog's diet mm -hmm. Are you saying that we need to include more of this as they get older? I remember a while back vets were saying that dog, older dogs, senior dogs need less protein. Uh, and I don't know if as a whole, the industry has changed with that advice, but where do you stand on that? Well, I think it's related a bit more to kidney disease where with kidney disease, they say you should start limiting protein, which especially in the early you know stages of kidney disease i i think that's not a good idea because the kidneys also need good amounts of proteins and good quality protein so it's more about what you feed the quality of the food that you're feeding rather than necessarily the con the amount of protein but certainly as as it gets a little bit more progressed um, and, and they have more, you know, it, it gets, you know, more advanced, maybe reducing it just a little bit is good because of the phosphorus content as well. But certainly, um, I, yeah, protein is important for, for yeah. dogs. So I'm not, I'm not a big proponent of decreasing. Yeah, yeah. Same. Whoa, this is a long one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, lots of different supplements for this Collie Hound mix. He has noise and separation anxiety, mystery lumps and bumps, hips and joint issues, and starting we're starting to watch his kidneys and support them. They do chiropractic care and acupuncture to help his joints, but giving him supplements can be tricky. But I think the question is, what are some of the best tests to do as they get older? Well, as they get older, I recommend uh, testing, you know, doing like a senior panel every six months, because that way you can monitor the kidneys, the liver, blood cells, and, and so on. Um, I also like to run vitamin D testing mm -hmm. and regular fecals for, um, you know, to check their, you know, check them for parasites. So those are certainly um, 
tests that I like to run on older dogs. Um, certainly there are other tests, you know, especially if you have some suspicion of any sort of lumps and bumps that are a little bit weird, um, you know, doing x-rays, for example, to, you know, check if they have any metastasis anywhere, um, doing abdominal ultrasounds. But that would be a little bit more if I really suspect um, something, but it certainly could also be done a little more, bit more routinely in order to maybe catch something a little bit earlier, although some of these lumps, they, you know, masses in the abdomen, they can happen pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, so doesn't mean that you're necessarily catching it early. Um, and then there are some other tests as well where you uh, can do a little bit of a cancer screening. Uh, VDI Labs has a test for that. Um, yeah. What was the name of the labs that has the cancer screening? Uh, VDI. VDI labs. Mm -hmm. I'll look yeah. into that. So, yeah. And then certainly also testing tighter levels instead of continuing the, with vaccinations because older dogs, they don't really die from infection. They usually die from chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So continuing to vaccinate them until they're almost dead, that's, I think, not a really great idea. So tighter testing certainly for distemper and parvo. And then rabies, obviously, we have a law um, on that. But if, if there are any sort of health issues, most, you know, many states, we are in many states, we're allowed to write exemption letters. So if I have any suspicions of anything, if a dog comes in with allergies, GI issues, whatever it may be, I will write them an exemption letter because they should only be vaccinated if they're completely healthy. And if they're not, they shouldn't. Um, so definitely that's a, a big, big part because yearly vaccination of an old senior dog, that, that's just not a good idea. Right. <laughs> and there's no real purpose, especially, I mean, depending on the vaccine, if they're at home with their owner, you know, occasionally out on hikes and things and not in contact with other dogs, but the vaccine, Oh my gosh, that topic is something that we're going to have to cover. It's a big one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Are lumps and bumps just something that we should expect to see as our dogs enter their senior years? Well, ideally not, but unfortunately, again, coming back to our world and how polluted and toxic it is, I think it's a little bit harder to avoid. Mm. Uh, just because, yeah, we're all being rained on and it's difficult to, to stay healthy in an environment that really does not promote health. Um, so with lumps and bumps, I suspect that they're there in order to take away some of the toxins as well, like some of the lipomas, for example. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that might be one way that the body is trying to move something that's a little bit more toxic out of the circulation because a lot of toxins that we find in the environment are fat soluble and they get stored in fat. Mm -hmm. so they get taken out of the circulation and put into fatty tissue. And so with lumps and bumps, generally I just recommend watching them unless there's one that's really suspicious and growing funny and or painful or hard and kind of weird shapes. Um, but otherwise, I generally just kind of sort of leave them alone because there have been dogs that had lumps removed and they did worse afterwards just because you sort of took away that storage space. At least yeah. that's how I explain it. Do I, I, I don't know for sure that that's the case, but, yeah. you know, taking something away can be a challenge for for the for the body afterwards, because we have to remember that the body has an intelligence. Right. And so it does certain things in order to maintain itself. So then we, if we take that away, then that could throw it off, you know? Yeah. Hope here says, I've heard some lumps and bumps can be caused by a stuck energy flow. Um, and I think that's referencing qi and traditional Chinese medicine. Are you familiar with that thought? Yeah, so any sort of lumps and bumps and pain, for example, is usually a stagnation of energy. So in Chinese um, medicine terms, so yes, I have heard of that. Yeah, yeah, it's a real thing. 
Uh, do you recommend getting pen hip or OFA tests when the dog is young? I'm not sure. I'm not familiar, too familiar with those. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so those are uh, ways to x-ray to see if there's hip dysplasia. So there are just two different type of tests um, that can be done. And I mean, it depends on the dog. It depends on whether you suspect it. I mean, in a German Shepherd, for example, probably a good idea to, to check that just because they're a little bit more prone to that. Or if you have a suspicion that there might be some um, hip pain or some, some issue there, you know, if they're kind of having a different, a bit of a strange angle in their hips or they're not moving the way they should like a young dog, um, that sort of thing. Would I recommend it on every dog? No. And if they are prone to hip dysplasia, any food uh, supplements that you recommend adding into the diet or other preventative measures generally? Well, I think where you would get the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to hip dysplasia is making sure that the muscles surrounding the, the hip are really strong because the hip, again, the muscles are stabilizing the joints and a stable joint will be a happier joint. Mm -hmm. So when, and that's that's oftentimes the problem in, in senior dogs is they start to have a little bit of pain in one of the joints. And then as a result, they use that leg less. There's muscle atrophy that comes from that. And then the joint becomes even more unstable. And then it ha they have even more pain. Yeah. And then they use it even less, and then the muscles waste even more. So it's like this downward spiral. And if you can prevent that downward spiral from happening early on by maintaining good muscle mass, exercising, uh, there are you know there are rehab vets out there who can help you come up with a good program for a dog that's specific and you know training and enhancing certain muscle groups if they're you know um, atrophied or are not developed as much so i think that's that's where you get the biggest bang for your buck really but then there are certainly a lot of supplements that can help um, mm -hmm. there's you know supplements joint supplements with msm chondroitin um, you know, the green lip muscle um, that you um, sell. So there are a lot of different supplements out there that, you know, can be used certainly, but making sure that the nervous system is working properly and, and all the muscles are firing at the, you know, the way they should is, is yeah. really important. And you know. I think even for us, unfortunately, we're not nearly as active as we should be. Um, mm -hmm. And that will lead into how we are, how active we are with our dogs. But just to add on to that, I know dogs that are prone to some of those hip and joint issues, low impact exercises, mm -hmm. like swimming, if they'll get into the water. Um, and even uh, the the back, the rear end awareness and focus on, on going mm -hmm. up and down, that has worked really well for us. We've always had big dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, so the supplements for senior dogs, you talked about MSN, um, chondroitin, glucosamine. What, to add on to this, can you talk a little bit about the difference between whole food sources of, um, of these additives versus the, for lack of a better word, synthetic supplements that we're seeing as specifically advertised to dogs for joint health? Yeah, so with the whole food supplement, you're always getting other things too. It's not just that one thing. It's kind of like with CBD oils, you know, if you get just the CBD itself, you don't get all the other flavonoids and whatever else is terpenes and whatever else is in there. I can't remember all of it now, but in any case, there's like a a synergi synergistic effect that's happening between the different things and when we have synthetic ingredients, sometimes the chemical structure is not the exact same as it would be in nature. And then the body is like, huh, what is that? I don't know what it is. So let's get rid of it. And it just uh, passes through without using it. Yeah. Or it at least doesn't have the same effect. So I think that 
you know, because we live in nature, well, we don't live in nature anymore, but we came from nature, <laughs> basically. Um, our body is made to process the things that are found in nature. And there's such intelligence in nature that there are multiple different things in one plant, for example, that can give different you know that just kind of enhances itself so for example vitamin c that comes from a plant like rosehip for example can potentially be much more potent than a synthetic vitamin c just because it comes in that plant and it comes in a way that the body can recognize it and absorb it yeah so, what about raw bones as your source raw meaty bones of for calcium and glucosamine yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you just need to make sure it's somewhat balanced with the rest of the diet because you don't want to overfeed calcium, of course. But definitely, um, again, the closer you can feed them, you know, the diet that they would eat in the wild, the better. So if you can find a furry rabbit somewhere um, yeah. and have them chew on it, they will get some brain, some eyes, some lung tissue. They will get some GI content. They will get some fur. Um, they'll pretty much get everything, including some of the hormone glands. Um, so, you know, that would obviously be ideal, not yeah. always feasible, but. It is, if you guys are here in San Diego, I've got whole prey rabbits in my freezer open to the San Diego community. So that's what I'm gonna be feeding my dog this weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good, good, do they know how to take it apart? <laughs> uh, he does, fortunately, yes. He's been raw fed since four months old and mm -hmm. uh he figured it out pretty quickly when we gave him whole prey oh good good <laughs> I, had it. I tried it on a couple of afghan hounds <laughs> they're like so what, what do, do we I do, do? <laughs> <laughs> right so i had to start cutting it open for them yeah i think i did the first time i had to cut the guts open um mm -hmm. right around where the liver and kidney lie and and then he figured it out yeah, yeah. what do you recommend for a senior dog who has no teeth well Dogs don't really chew a whole lot. Uh, they are gulpers. So for any of those of you who are worried that their anim your animals are eating too fast, that's not usually an issue because they are not made to chew things. They don't have the teeth to do that. You know, we have flat teeth pretty much that are made to grind things. Whereas dogs have more pointy teeth. They're really more there to, to rip things and uh, not to really chew. Plus, they also have much fewer taste buds than we do, which is another sign that they probably don't enjoy food through their mouth quite as much as they do through their noses. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyways, so if a dog doesn't have teeth, it's not a problem. But if they are a little bit decreased in their ability to digest things, you could always put it in a blender and, and you know, right. turn it into a bit of a mushy sort of gruel, I guess. Well, um, I, I we have this uh, this situation frequently at our farmers markets when people come to our booth and they ask for chews, and then they say, "But my dog doesn't have any teeth." And part of me wants to be like, "Well, there's a reason why your dog has lost their teeth before they're mm -hmm. even entered their senior years." Um, periodontal disease, you know, that's, that's a whole topic in and it itself, but what, why did, why are dogs losing their teeth so early on and how can we prevent it? Well, for small dogs, I think the problem is that they were, their head shrank, but their teeth didn't shrink at the same rate. So very oftentimes there's crowding happening. So mm -hmm. the teeth are just too big for the mouth mm -hmm. and there are too many of them. I mean, not that they're, you know, they still have the normal amount of teeth, but it's just that there's not enough room for all of them. And I think that is a big component of what's going on with small dogs, you know, why they get so much um, dental, um, you know, periodontal disease is because of that crowding. Uh, plus obviously the diet and everything plays a role too, but it seems like small dogs tend to have more of the dental issues than larger dogs. So for the small dogs, I will send them to the dentist you know, much more regularly than, than the bigger dogs because they tend to have less issues. Yeah. Wow. I hadn't thought about the teeth crowding. Mm -hmm. Dogs. Yeah. Uh, can arthritis be reversed or is it just management once it starts? 
Well, I'm not sure about reversing it necessarily, but certainly you can prevent it from getting worse. Uh, but if you can get a joint to work better, then maybe some of that. I mean, I've, I've heard some reports where it was reversed in the sense that the bony proliferation that you would see on an X-ray decreased when the whole leg uh, was getting healthier and, and moving better, um, certainly. But yeah, usually it's more management, but even better, it would be to prevent it in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Stay active, eat good food mm -hmm. for us too. Yeah, and decrease um, vaccines again, because there, there was a study done at Purdue University and they found that just one vaccination caused autoimmunity in all dogs that had received a vaccine. And autoimmune, what they found is that there were antibodies to all kinds of different proteins in the body, including DNA, but also collagen. And collagen is basically a connective tissue fiber type that is present in, you know, most everything, mm -hmm. you know, tendons, ligaments, fascia, you know, whatever surrounds the, the muscles, et cetera. And so when you have autoimmunity and the body attacking itself, there's always inflammation involved at the same time. And so that inflammation can then you know, cause arthritis in the joints if the joint collagen is being attacked. Depleted, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Do you know when that study came out from Purdue? Um, it was a while ago. I, I'd have to look it up, but it's not available online. They, you know, obviously uh, conveniently removed it <laughs> because, well, <laughs> yeah, it's quite, a, it's a very damning study for, the vaccine industry. Yeah. So, wow. yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to do another segment on vaccinations and titer testing. Uh, that has become more popular here, at least in San Diego. And I see more and more people asking their vets for it, but it's still not really common knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking it up real quick, but yeah it's a it's a it's a big problem yeah so it came out in 2000 oh no never mind that's just the the wrong one but anyways yeah it, i mean it's a, not a new study it's been out for a little while yeah um, but yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look it for it for you guys don't worry we will find it and share it with you um, well it's not it's not it's unavailable online you cannot find it i mean dogs naturally magazine talks about it but it's not the full study um again they were they removed it because well the vaccine they probably got too much pushback from the vaccine industry i have so much to say right now but i'm not going to <laughs> Okay, I think we might be wrapping up our last question here. Thus, mm -hmm. hour flew by. Um, oh wait, nope. I see a bunch more, but we'll yeah. we'll get to as many as we can. Is laser therapy beneficial for hip health? Yeah, it can help. Definitely, it can help decrease inflammation. It can help increase blood flow. Uh, it can decrease pain. So definitely, if there's an issue there, it can be quite health helpful. Um, Can for you sure. talk a little bit more about laser therapy? How does it work? <laughs> I just talked to that about laser with my group this morning. Um, and I, I have to admit that laser therapy is not my top knowledge base. I've, I've used laser. I, I do use laser a little bit, but I have to say I, I don't know a ton but it basically brings energy through um, different light uh, frequencies, especially in the infrared um, light spectrum. Um, so it brings energy into it and helps the, the cells in that way to function more efficiently. And, and as a result, then, you know, inflammation can be decreased, pain sensation, and so on. Yeah. Well, it's something also about hip health that uh, I think inadvertently we sort of just glazed over is when we or our dogs are overweight, 
Mm, that's yeah. a lot of stress on the joints. And so we're talking mm -hmm. about a lot of other, you know, preventative measures, keeping them active and um, feeding the right foods to support those hips and joints. But once they're carrying more weight than their bones need to, mm -hmm. that's where I think we run into a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. there's, there's probably more of a misconception among dog owners than uh, when viewing dogs and viewing themselves as humans and seeing a dog that looks the way that they do and the standards that we uh, sort of attach to that, a lot of dogs are overweight. And when you have a fit, active dog, they're perceived as too skinny or sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's true because all we see is overweight dogs. And when I tell people that their dog is overweight, they look at me with like, as if I had two heads and I'm like, yeah, your dog's overweight. And they think it's too skinny. <laughs> like, no, no, that's not the case. It's very rare that I see a dog that's underweight actually. Yeah. And they call me the weight police because I'm like a, with a dog with a bone when it comes to that, because it's just so unhealthy because that extra fat that they carry is not just extra weight it's also causing more inflammation in the body because if that fat is not just sitting there doing nothing it's actually metabolically active mm -hmm. and not in a good way so it, it creates more inflammation plus i mean yeah they feel better when they can move around and i don't care if they're always hungry i <laughs> i have very little compassion for that i'm like <laughs> whatever i don't care if your dog is always hungry he's overweight so we need yeah. something about he that how do you what are your tips for uh your clients and helping their dogs lose weight well what i do is i i help figure out how much they should have and i tell them how much you know how much to give because what i do is i figure out approximately what their optimal weight should be and then we feed according to that and decrease it even a little bit more because we want them to lose some weight sure um, and then i recommend weighing them every week so that we can keep track yeah because there are obviously also metabolic issues that can cause weight gain such as hypothyroidism and, and these types of things so um i want to know whether they can lose weight when fed the amount that they should be getting or not because if they can't if they're not losing the weight with what we're doing then we need to look further um, sure. We don't want to put them in starvation mode either, because if, if we do that, then their body will shut down. Their metabolism will slow down because it will try to hang on to the calories because you're basically put, putting them in a state of yeah starvation. Uh, and, yeah. And they're just trying to survive. Exactly. Exactly. So what are your thoughts on fasting? Yeah, definitely. Fasting is a great thing for dogs. Um, obviously, it depends a little bit again. If it's a dog that throws up on an empty stomach frequently, it may not be the best idea to do that. Um, in a senior dog, it, it will depend a little bit on where they're at in their journey and how they can handle it. Or if it's a really small dog that may have some hypoglycemia issues, you'd want to be careful with that. But there are a lot of people in the raw food community, especially who will fast their dogs one day a week, for example, and then just give a little bit more the other days. Um, certainly what are the benefits to doing that? Well, I mean, the benefit of fasting is basically that you give the body a little bit of a break from having to digest food and process food and, and deal with the food. And that then allows the body to just kind of deal with some other things that are present. Like, for example, in humans doing a three-day fast can actually turn your immune system around. Mm. So if you have autoimmune disease, for example, doing a three day fast can really kind of turn things around. Now I'm not saying telling people here to <laughs> go do that because I don't want to be responsible for it, but I myself had some autoimmune issues and it wasn't until I did like a three day juice fast that my body finally came back into balance and yeah. I was able to get off some of the, you know, the steroids that I was on mm -hmm. comfortable. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it can be very beneficial. And I, I do some, you know, a little bit of fasting here and there myself, um, especially the intermittent fasting where I don't eat for a certain amount of hours, you know, or only eat during a short period of time, like, mm -hmm. you know, six to eight hours or so. And, and then the rest of the time I don't eat anything. 
And that also gives the body a little bit of a rest and also the ability to heal and process. Uh, because if there's not a lot of food coming in, especially if you're doing a little bit of a longer fast, it will start to break down some of the old tissue and the you know, the body will basically start to auto digest itself a little bit. And especially mm -hmm. the stuff that's all, you know, gunky, <laughs> yeah. very technical. Um, so it, it can have um, definitely some, some benefits there, but again, it very much depends on, on the animal and what they can handle. Um, sure. Yeah. And, and that, what you're saying is the, the theme that I've um, sort of identified over these past few weeks with this, this live series is that we are ingrained to think we need to eat three or four times a day, mm -hmm. but we don't, you know, and, and same for our dogs. We feel guilty not giving them a meal on certain days, but sometimes mm -hmm. that's just what our, our bodies need. So we have to unlearn what mm -hmm. we've learned all of these years. Yeah. And a lot of dogs, they will also tell you when and how much they want to eat. And people oftentimes will freak out if their animal doesn't want to eat for a whole day. Right. Maybe they they just don't need it. Maybe they got too much food the day before and they're like, yeah, I'm not really that hungry. And what you're offering is not that great. You know, if you were to come out with some ice cream, right. I would consider, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, so, and I also see it and sometimes in, in puppies, you know, as they get like to the six month mark where they don't grow nearly as much, but they're still getting more food, you know, the, the same amount of food that they were getting when they were growing. So in some of those puppies, they will not eat as much or as well. And, and so then I tell people, well, that's because your puppy is actually overweight and is probably just not hungry. Yeah. Um, so they know they know themselves better than we do we just yeah are, we need to know what to look for yeah but i know it's difficult because as you said we have this sort of this mindset that they need to eat and if they don't eat there's something wrong right but uh, i do you know in, in regards to fasting i do, do want to mention that cats uh you don't want to fast cats they need to eat at least once every 24 hours mm especially those that are overweight because if you were to fast them they would start to mobilize a lot of fat and that fat would get stuck in the liver and the liver would have a major problem with that um, mm -hmm. and they can get really sick and to the point where they would die so um, with cats you don't want to do that and horses as well because they produce stomach acid 24 7 mm -hmm. so they always have to have a little bit of something in their um, stomach. So there are not, fasting is not good for every species of animal. Great advice. I know I'm all into the dogs and forget about the cat sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we're just about uh, up our full hour. Um, I think I got to most of your questions as many as I could. Um, Dr. Suter, any last words for our audience with dogs approaching their senior years and maybe, you know, two or three simple things they can do to prevent some of these health issues we're seeing? Well, as I mentioned, body work, super important, exercise, super, super, super important, vital, essential, <laughs> you know, whatever adjective you can find. <laughs> For that so fitness and exercise is super important and then you know as they get older we also start to get a little more sad so looking at emotional health for ourselves is important as well so that we don't just go into fear mode and worry mode and they're gonna die kind of mode but also make sure that we enjoy them connect with them love them you know, be on that same wavelength with them as far as the heart is concerned. So dropping out of the head mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. the back into the heart. So breathing with them, spending time with them, um, doing things that they want to do, um, things that they enjoy, and then also keeping them mentally focused and sharp um, yeah. by taking them out different places, having some social life, um, not doing the same thing over and over again because the brain needs stimulation uh, right you, you lose goes for the brain as well so if you're always having a bland day 
their brain will be, become bland pretty quickly as well. So you want to keep a little bit of excitement and and such um, going in their lives. And and yeah, we, yeah, a lot of that comes through movement and going places, you know, go out in nature with them. Even if they can't move all that well anymore, go sit in a park somewhere or go into the forest preserve, take them in a little wagon and pull them along with you um, just so they can see things and be in nature. Do something um, different. We play a game uh, called to go on a sniffari. Yeah. The treats and just let them find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. You definitely need to keep their, their mental, uh, you know, them mentally active for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Suter. Is there a Facebook group that you have that uh, our viewers can find you and maybe join? Um, I just have my Facebook uh, page. I'm, I'm not in any particular group at the moment, but I do have a, a program that I offer that has a social um, group, you know, as a, a community where people can learn about, you know, all the different aspects that are essential for, for health and, you know, kind of going a little bit more deeply into the things that we just talked about. So Awesome. And we'll, so we'll drop your website in the comments below so people know where to reach you. Yeah. Uh, we also do nutrition consultations as part of our membership. So if anyone is interested in learning more and, you know, small tweaks that you can make to your dog's diet, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much for joining us again. And thank you, everyone, for uh, all of your comments and joining in. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Ruby. It was a pleasure and an honor. And thanks, everyone, for joining in on the great questions. All right. You guys have a good night.